easy. Welcome back. Professor Roundtree here, Marketing 3401, Chapter 9, Part 2. Where we left off last time, we talked about the last stage, the last step in the introduction of a new product, the process of developing a new product. Now we want to focus on assuming that we've decided to bring a product to market, how do you successfully manage it? And we'll, we'll kind of talk about you know, some of those things that will make um, the uh, possibility of a successful introduction uh, more likely. So generally, when we think about products that are successful and those that have failed, generally speaking, these are some of the reasons why the ones who make it make it. Uh, the first one talks more so about having a customer-centered product development uh, process. Um, remember going way back to the very beginning of the course, we talked about companies being market oriented. In other words, you make products that you know will satisfy demands that consumers really want met. And so it's about doing research. Many companies uh, create products based on the fact that they have superior technology and the engineers can create things that are new and innovative, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's something people are willing to pay for. Okay. So they typically will have the customer as the focal point, the center point for developing the, these new products. And so when we're thinking about solving problems, you really have to bring consumers in. So again, it's about being more market oriented. In addition to that, companies who are very successful will have what we would call a cross-functional team approach. In other words, you're going to have people from all departments around a company. Obviously, you're going to have the research and development people, your engineering people. If it's a physical product, you're going to have manufacturing people so they can really help you figure out whether or not you have the excess capacity, whether or not you need new property, plant, and equipment uh, to get the job done. You'll have marketing people. The legal team will be there to support you in terms of looking at what you can protect legally from an intellectual property standpoint, trademarks, copyrights, um, patents, of course. And, and so it's about having people from all different departments who overlap. And, and the core goal is to, to really make sure that they work together to maximize the potential for success of a new product being introduced. And these companies also have a systematic approach in terms of you know collecting reviews and evaluations and managing these ideas so it's a way to get all the ideas on the table the ideas heard getting feedback from a cross-functional perspective uh, feedback potentially from suppliers who are providing the raw materials that we need all the strategic partners that we would use for distribution all these people are coming together and having a systematic approach most companies who bring many products to market on a regular basis, they have a template and they know what works in terms of the process steps. Now, that doesn't mean that every single product will be successful. But what they do is they maximize the potential for success by having a systematic approach to developing new products and launching new products. And so every product that is put out into the marketplace um, has a beginning. They have a start, and we're introducing this concept called the product life cycle. And this is a very common tool that managers will use to try to get an understanding of where a product is over the life of the product. And essentially, if you look at the bottom, it talks about it as relates to a concept of time. Depending on the industry, these could be months, these could be years. In a technology-driven company, a full life cycle might be a year, year and a half, if we're talking about software, maybe two years. If we're talking about uh, washers and dryers, a full life cycle might be over the course of 20 years. They might put some bells and whistles in there, add some additional features to it, but by and large, it's not gonna be any revolutionary kind of change to it. So essentially here, the product life cycle looks at over a period of time, the amount of sales and profit that are generated by that product, and it organizes it into different stages or phases. 
The first is looking at more of the product development stage. And in, in that stage, you can see uh, we're not making any money. Everything's in the red. And so the real takeaway broadly that I want you to get from this is the fact that what we're looking at is various stages in a typical product life cycle. What we want to do is to focus more on what are the marketing strategies? Oops, sorry. What are the marketing strategies in each of these stages and how they might be different in terms of importance as we lead ourselves through this life cycle? So, for example, when we think about brand new products to the marketplace, think about what's the critical and important thing to do. One, you got to create awareness. And so ask yourselves the question, how do we create awareness using our marketing strategies? Obviously, promotion P, very important. The product P will always be important there in terms of the features that you add, the packaging, if, if that's going to be important in the category. The pricing is going to be critical. You want to make sure you price it to the point where you can skim the market, where you can get those people who are willing to pay full price or premium price at the onset because they want to lead the pack, they want to be the innovators, the people who get that iPad 4 the very first time compared to everybody else. And so in this early stage here, it's about product and product development, pricing it appropriately, promoting it in a way that makes sense for those people who you believe who will adopt that product initially, and also to the distribution channel. You got to make sure that the retailers are on board, either online retailers or physical brick and mortar stores. If it's a very complicated uh, technical kind of product, do we have enough documentation physically to train people to actually learn the specifics of this particular product. If we get it in the hands of the consumers, is there enough documentation to, to demonstrate to them how to use it if it's a revolutionary new kind of product? And then once the product gets introduced into the marketplace, we can talk about it in terms of maybe building some buzz and we can figure out how we can do that, maybe using social media, try to generate some interest by getting some public relations or free publicity about this new and innovative idea. Pricing generally remains around the same as it was at the introduction here. And so the objective here is to take it through the entire life cycle and then say, as a, as a very, very broad example, once we get to the point where product matures and it starts to decline, one of the ways you can use this tool is to then say, how do we bring back a product that's on a decline? How can we bring it back to this growth stage? And again, always go back to your P's. Is it something that might have to be reshaped based on the, the packaging? Maybe add an extra ingredient. The old new and improved has been around for decades. So a lot of times they do what they do is they add in a new ingredient to inject life back into a product. And so you'll see it come back on, into the marketplace, new and improved um, laundry soap. And it has some active ingredient and they give it some very technical kind of name. So we believe that it does something different from the old version of, of the uh, packaged soap. And so in the introductory stage, we'll see all the P's will, import, will be important. At the very early stage, it's going to be about promotion and creating awareness. Once we get to this growth stage where pretty much people know a lot in terms of awareness about our product, here it's really about driving demand. So rather than trying to create awareness at this growth stage, we want to have more persuasive advertising, getting them to run out to that showroom and get that test drive going and then sign that lease or, or, or purchase that car and, 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 and pay for it through your car note or with cash or however else you're gonna pay for it. Then we move into more of the maturity stage where the sales have kind of peaked over a period of time. And again, depending on the industry, this period of time could be very long eh, or it could be something relatively short. But the important point here is that we have to start thinking once it hits that peak, whether or not we want to milk it. Remember, we go back to the BCG concept where we talked about the um, cash cows. These are going to be your cash cows. Lots of revenue and sales coming in at this particular time, but actually no real growth. So in some ways, it has only two places to go. It can either go back on the curve where you can kind of ascend the growth. We can kind of go up in this direction and then kind of level off, okay, over the time. Or when we see it start to decline, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want to continue to manufacture that product? 
maybe it's no longer a premium product and maybe the pricing is what's the issue. Maybe it needs to be more of a, a value oriented kind of brand. We see this uh, many times with uh, cologne related to um, designer brands. Uh, some designers do a really great job. Calvin Klein does a great job. It's still considered a premium brand. Pierre Cardin, which many years ago was a premium brand in the same name and vein as Calvin Klein, but they essentially let that brand die in terms of the apparel and fashion and even the cologne itself. Now you can buy in, in Walgreens and CVS versus some of the higher end brands. You can't even touch that in, unless you're going to a specialty store or a high end department store. And so the point again is this looks at sales relative to time. Now, you can, you can plot a uh, curve, that, that, that the life cycle curve, for your particular brand and then look at where your competitors' brands are. And then you could look at it as an industry overall. Obviously, as a brand manager, we want to make sure that our brand is in a better situation than our competitors. So while they may be here on the decline stage, we love our brand to be more on the growth stage, or at least peaking out here being a true cash cow. If the industry is on decline, and we're up here and still, you know, we're leveled off, we're, we're still doing well, always ask the question, what accounts for the difference? Do we have better promotion? Possibly. Do we have better distribution strategies or relationships that enable us to continue to grow in the same category? Flip it and say, maybe we're the ones on decline and all the competitors and the industry is still at the, the plateau stage and not declining. Ask ourselves the question, what are we doing wrong and what are they doing right? So again, but always go back to the, the P's themselves. Okay, so I kind of kind of talked about this. I mean, these are, the, again, the general stages. And again, each of these stages in terms of the breadth or width of that portion of the curve is dependent upon the industry and the specific brand that we're talking about. There, there are some, for example, if we, if we look at the contrast here in terms of different types of products, if we think about something that's more stylish, think about what goes on in terms of style. Um, there are certain things that, that, that um, we see now. Think about shoes. When I was younger, way back in the day, um, square-toed shoes were very popular. Then they went away for a while, and now they're very popular again. And so we see that where it goes ebbs and flows. It goes up and down in terms of what's popular um, in terms of style. You can think about it in terms of hairstyling, the length of the style, the things that people do with their hair, the, the, the shape and the contour of certain types of, of fashion, kind of putting it into the, the, the middle box here. Something that's a fad, as an example, typically will be something that skyrockets very high and then plummets down very, very quickly. There is a fine line between, because if you have one more curve that goes up this way, we could argue that then it will start to resemble something that's stylish. But typically a fad is going to be something that has a meteoric kind of rise and then it plummets and crashes. Um, once it gets to this point where it crashes, it's really difficult. I mean, way back in the day, they used to have these things called earth shoes, very funny looking shoes or, or pet rocks. People would buy rocks or they have mood rings and, and some of the other things that come out. And you folks can think about some of the things that, that you believe today that are very popular aren't going to really last uh, more than the next oh, two, three, maybe four years, which is a long time for something that is considered to be more faddish. Okay. Now, kind of kind of summing up some of these in terms of you know what's really important within each stage. Again, at the introductory stage, slow sales, which is expected, slow sales, but you have to match that up to the high cost to introduce something. So you're, you're working at a loss there. Little or no profit at all. Usually it's going to be a loss. Uh, also, too, high distribution and promotional expense. Uh, they have these things called slotting fees, and, and that's basically legalized extortion by retailers where you have to pay them cash money to be able to get a product onto the shelf of Walmart or Target. And 
the bigger companies don't have to necessarily pay that. If you're Procter & Gamble, who has hundreds of, of, of SKUs on their shelves, you don't have to do that. But an individual entrepreneur like us, if we want to get on the shelves of Walmart or Target, we'd have to come up with some significant guarantee. Think about it this way. If you're Walmart and you know that you drive enough traffic to your stores, you want things that will essentially sell themselves and fly off the shelf. With a brand new product, for them, it's a risk to put it on the shelf because they don't know if there's enough support behind it in terms of uh, promotion, whether or not what the benefits are will be received by the marketplace. So what they basically ask you to do is to provide a guarantee of revenue for the shelf space that you want to occupy. It's, it's legalized extortion, but that's how they protect themselves from putting something on the shelf that's slow to sell versus many other products that they know they can put out there that will fly off the shelves, as they say. During this growth phase, obviously, this, this is re really where all the excitement is. I mean, people get all amped up, people who manage these brands. They see sales going up. The downside, though, is like any business, once you start to demonstrate that there is a market for a particular product, the Me Too products come to market. People who will knock you off in terms of copying what you do, they reverse engineer what you have legally, and if you're not protected by a patent, they just copy the idea and they sell it. Okay. Anytime you have any product, for example, uh, a popular doll or a popular game, people just make a little tweak to it that, that might be a little bit innovative in a certain type of way, it's replicated. You see it a lot more on the internet. Groupon comes out, next thing you know, you have Living Social, you have Amazon deals, you have all these different local deal sites all around the country. A really good idea will be replicated overnight. And once you introduce competition, what typically happens to the pricing of that product or service? That price for the product or service introducing competition will bring the price down. If your costs are not in control, you're going to start experiencing diminished margins or you might just lose money outright. And hopefully we have some profits that can be taken early on during this growth stage because we have our, our, our costs under control. We're able to bring the pro product to market in a way that's cheaper. Our prices were high to begin with. Once that competition enters the marketplace and it has an impact on price, that's when you start seeing sort of a pinch on the profitability of it. But during this growth phase, you're still in that, that honeymoon phase. Um, also, too, the promotion and the manufacturing costs that we have to physically create the product, we have economies of scale, basically meaning all those costs are now spread out amortized over many, many more hundreds of thousands or millions of units. So it becomes a little bit more cost effective. At the maturity phase, things start to slow down. Uh, it slows down because of competition. Um, you find that there's competition for suppliers and the raw materials that they actually sell. Uh, there's competition for the minds of the consumers. We talked about positioning. If, if you can't maintain a premium price because people perceive your product to be much better than what exists out there in the marketplace, including the Me Too types of products, even the generic stuff that you'll see that's being knocked off by um, store brands. And so when we see that kind of stuff, uh, we realize that, you know, once stores start coming out with a generic offering that's when the competition heats up and it's going to siphon off those people who are price sensitive anytime we increase capacity it it's going to lead to capacity it, it lead to com competition any increase in demand for a product brings suitors to the marketplace to absorb some of that excess demand because you can't really satisfy everybody um, so then you start getting to the point where you have to make some decisions, like I said before. What do you do? Do you use research and development to try to redo the existing product or the packaging? Maybe you do need something that's called new and improved. Maybe there's a new line of products that you want to bring out. You bring out the iPad mini as an example. So you're looking to satisfy that niche market, that smaller market compared to tablets for those people who want a smaller version of a tablet. And so I think Samsung and some of the others had the small 7-inch tablets out there for a while. And Apple only had their 10.1-inch. And they realized that many people were 
choosing those small seven inch tablets because they're more portable, you can hold it in one hand. And so they decided uh, what they needed to do was not to make any change to the iPad for that purpose in terms of size, but for right now, have a separate uh, offering for people who are looking for a smaller version of a tablet. So once we decide what we're going to do in terms of modifying this product, we can modify it and, and maybe, it's, maybe, maybe the market needs to be uh, informed about what's actually going on with relate to the usage of our product. Maybe we need to inform them that, that our product can be used for alternative purposes. Uh, the example I always give is baking soda. That product had been on life support for the longest time, 50, 60 years ago. And they realized that they didn't know how people were truly using the product that they actually created. Baking soda was originally created for baking purposes, but they realized that people used them for different things. Odor absorption was the primary one when you put it in the refrigerator. But it's also right now a very important active ingredient, which is more of an industrial product that people put into toothpaste and deodorant, uh, cleaning supplies. And so that particular product was on life support in terms of the maturity and the decline stage, or the decline stage rather. And they said, what can we do to inject more life into this particular product, baking soda? And Arm & Hammer was the, is the company. And so their, their decision of their choice was not to try to reinvent it as a consumer product, but basically bring it out as more of an industrial product as an ingredient to many products that we buy and have on our shelves. So we modify the product, we might reposition it to a new market. Um, we might even figure out how we can, you know, modify the marketing mix that we're using. Maybe we need to provide more persuasion in terms of promotion. Maybe it's a different distribution strategy. Maybe it might be our product can't be perceived as premium any longer, so we can not only exclusively try to sell them in the premium-oriented department stores. Maybe there's a market for it in a lower-end type of store. And, of course, there also, too, you may think about modifying your price, um, potentially maybe modifying the packaging itself, making it a little bit more functional and useful. Uh, all these strategies would be things that you'd have to consider, again, trying to inject life into a struggling brand. So once it gets to this point, we got to ask ourselves the question, what do we do when it starts to decline? And usually in this decline stage, we start looking at it losing money. And so if it starts to hemorrhage money, the question is, is there benefit for keeping it around? I think an example I talked about before relates to Coca-Cola and their tab brand. They don't make any money from tab, but they still put it out on the shelves because they have a small niche market of people who still prefer tab as their diet soft drink they don't want to drink diet coke and so for them it's more of a public relations issue to make sure that that small niche market has a product that they love and continues to buy and then people tell stories like this um, maybe you harvest it maybe you actually sell it um, what might be a dog to you maybe you just gave up and said we don't know how to, to reposition this product but maybe this product might fit better into a portfolio of someone else and maybe you just might want to just sell the product and or maybe you just want to close it down um, if it's taking up capacity in your manufacturing facilities where you could be using it to manufacture more of other things in your portfolio that are selling well or other ideas that are in the pipeline where you could use that capacity maybe it just might make sense to just go ahead and shut it down. Um, there are some social responsibility, public policy issues when it comes to this. Social responsibility, if we're talking about, for example, a product, a pharmaceutical product, a uh, pharmacological kind of product, a drug, um, unless there's some compelling reason to get rid of it, uh, oftentimes they continue to make the product, even if it's not profitable, because it makes more public relations sense. Um, and so anytime we think about dropping products, just keep in mind that if you're manufacturing other brands, you have to make sure that your decision for one particular brand that is struggling might have public relations repercussions 
that may have an impact across your entire company and all of your brands. Um, so as long as we're continuing to have good quality uh, products, uh, you have to make sure you continue to support it. We see this all the time when it comes to software. Um, I think Windows 95 was finally shut down by Microsoft completely because it was an old and dying product and they had been supporting uh, Windows, 90, Windows 95 up until the last couple of years. There were still some legacy people, people who had these on their machines that they didn't want to let go. So you see that a lot in the software industry and they keep it going. Uh, think about, for example, uh, printers, Hewlett Packard and all the others that make printers. Um, they have a responsibility for making sure that people who have those printers that they bought 5, 10, 15 years ago, that they continue to have support for it. Um, they may not continue to provide drivers for it, but they need to make available all the supplies, the toner and the ink and stuff that you actually have to put into it. Because what you don't want to do is to have a fiasco where you have a bunch of product out there and you don't support it any longer and people can't even get supplies to actually utilize it. And, and finally, some additional considerations here in, in terms of you know, products. Um, when we think about international products, just keep in mind too, new products here, um, many times we have to modify those products uh, that might adhere to local standards in other countries. Uh, so sometimes you know, having a standardized product, maybe in terms of the content, maybe the packaging has to be changed just a little bit by way of the color, the labeling laws that are in other countries um, in terms of the ingredients and, and how we might label a product, for example, as low fat, the requirements within those local governments may vary from country to country. And so it's a big undertaking. And so the question you'll always have to ask yourself is how much leverage can we get from the existing product that we have? The goal is to sell the existing product and bundle the benefits in every country around the world if you can, but with minimal customization because customization, it comes at a cost. Okay, well, that, that winds up Chapter 9. And so next time we're going to move into pricing in Chapter 10 and pricing strategy in Chapter 11. And so uh, we're going to be done. And I'll uh, see you on the other side.